Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. This book tells in detail about the Muslim conquest of Spain under the Umayyad Caliphate from 711 AD to 718 AD. The conquest is also known as the Muslim conquest of the Iberian Peninsula or the Umayyad conquest of the Visigothic Kingdom. This conquest destroyed the Visigothic Kingdom and established the Umayyad Wilaya of Al-Andalus. It also resulted in the expansion of the Umayyad Caliphate and the Muslim rule into Europe. Start of Chapter 7 Deeper into Spain Musa bin Nusayr, governor of Africa and the Maghrib, was also commander-in-chief of the theater, which included Spain. He was responsible for operations on the peninsula but the knowledge which the Muslims had of Spain, especially its geography, was too limited for the formulation of a grand strategical design of invasion. They knew that it was a very large land. They knew somewhat more about the geographical character of the southern part of Spain, opposite North Africa. They knew that the Visigoths were a brave and strong nation. Beyond that, they knew little of Spain. Because of this lack of information, Musa was unable to prepare a detailed or precise plan of operations. All that was clear was the aim of the conquest of Spain. Musa's intention in sending Tariq and his Berbers to Spain was to test the power of the Visigoths and discover their strengths and weaknesses. Tariq would clash with the Goths. He would bleed them and prepare them for the final blow which Musa himself would deliver achieving a great victory in Spain. Tariq and his Berbers would bleed too, but such is war. This explains why, in response to Tariq's appeal for help, when faced by Roderick's large cavalry army, Musa sent him only another 5,000 foot soldiers, although he had 18,000 more troops with him in North Africa, including the flower of the Arab cavalry. But he had no illusions about the danger, when Tariq put his boats to the torch, Musa's apprehensions increased sharply. Now, even if he wished, he could not support his subordinate across the sea, a predicament about which he had been warned by the Caliph. He moved his quarters to the Maghrib, somewhere near Tangier or Ciota. Every day he would await news from across the strait and spent many hours in prayer. Then came Tariq's messenger with tidings of victory. Overjoyed and overcome with relief, Musa prostrated himself in prayer and rendered praise unto Allah. The tension passed. The anxiety ended. When that happened, Musa's relief turned to anger and envy. He had sent Tariq to Spain for what he thought would at best be an indecisive engagement. But instead of that, Tariq had won a resounding victory which shed luster on his arms and brought his fame and glory which Musa himself had hoped to win. Moreover, the vast spoils acquired in battle had gone to Tariq and his Berbers instead of being divided amongst all the warriors under Musa's command. This made him extremely angry. He sent a harsh and abusive letter to Tariq in which he forbade him any further advance. In fact, he ordered him to remain where he was until Musa had joined him. Having sent Tariq's messenger back with his letter, Musa began to make plans for crossing the strait with an even bigger army than Tariq's and taking on the conquest of the peninsula where Tariq had left off. He was a superb organizer, but he took his time. The summer was ending and it would be better to wait for the following campaigning season before resuming operations. Furthermore, having ordered Tariq not to advance any further, he had no doubt that Tariq would remain by the bank of the river Barbet and await the coming of Musa. In this, he was wrong. 
One of the first things that happened after the Battle of the Babit was that the sons of Witiza turned up at Tariq's headquarters. According to Muslim historians, they were Akila, Almondo, and Artabas. They came to confirm the arrangements which they had made with the Muslims during battle. Are you yourself the commander, or is there a commander above you? They asked Tariq. No, Tariq replied. Above me there is a commander, and above that commander there is a supreme commander. The princes then expressed a wish to go to Africa to see Musa bin Nusair and put their case before him. To this Tariq agreed. At their request, he gave them a letter in which he spelled out the agreement made with them in the matter of the crown lands owned by their father. The princes crossed the strait and met Musa, to whom they gave Tariq's letter, while they explained their case. Musa reiterated the pledge given by Tariq, but said that they would have to go to Damascus to see the caliph, who was the final authority in such matters. The princes then travelled to Damascus, where they were received by the caliph with much honour. He confirmed the arrangement made by Tariq. Thereafter they returned to Spain and took possession of the promised lands, each prince getting one thousand farms as his share. Almondo settled in Seville, Artabas in Cordoba, and Aquila in Toledo. The princes lived in peace and contentment on their estates, enjoying the fruits of their steadfastness and loyalty to the Muslims. After the passage of many years, Almondo died, and Artabas forcibly took possession of his late brother's lands. Thereupon Almondo's daughter, a beautiful and spirited girl named Sarah, who was to become known to the Muslims as al Qutiya, the lady goth, travelled to Damascus to see the caliph and demand redress of wrong done her by her uncle. At Damascus she not only received justice, but also acquired an Arab husband whom she brought back with her to Spain. But this happened a generation later and is outside the scope of this volume. A few days were spent on the battlefield, clearing the wreckage of war. The dead were buried, the wounded were treated, arrangements were made for prisoners, and for the collection and disposal of the spoils of war. Then there was the meeting with the sons of Witiza and their dispatch to North Africa to see Musa bin Nusair. News of the victory spread rapidly in the Maghrib. More Berber warriors, already converted to Islam, prepared to join the holy war and crossed over to Spain, using anything that could float. By now more boats had been built by Musa and these were used to ferry men and material across the strait. So fresh Berber contingents came to serve under the banner of Tariq, eager for battle and for its fruits. The number of new arrivals is not known but is believed to have been sufficient to make Tariq's battle losses, which means that he once again had an army of 12,000 men. And this time they were all mounted, on horses taken from the Goths. The remnants of the army of Spain broke into pieces on the bank of the Barbate, fled headlong from the scene of operations. Those who were not killed or captured were driven by fear, and seeking only to save themselves, scattered in all directions. They went wherever they thought they would find escape from the horrors of war. They took refuge in the hills and in distant castles, keeping away from the plains of which the Muslim cavalry was now master. Most units, in which there was still some order and cohesion, went northwards and were able to join other forces, not yet committed to battle. They still hoped that this was only a raid on a grand scale, that after collecting a good deal of booty, the invaders would go back home. At the beginning of August 711, middle of Shawal 92 Hijri, Tariq set off once again. His objective, as before, was Cordoba. He rightly decided to give the Goths no time to recover from their defeat, to crush the remaining opposition while it was still suffering from the physical and moral shock received at the Barbate. On his way, he would eliminate any resistance which might hinder his march. 
but in order not to get involved in dealing with opposition which was not relevant to his objective, he avoided Medina Sidonia, leaving it on his left and marched northwards. The first place where he met enemy soldiers was Moron de la Frontera, but they offered no opposition. The garrison surrendered peacefully. After receiving the submission of Moron, Tariq took the road to Cordoba, going first north and then northeast to approach Akija from the west. Akija was the ancient Astigis, situated on the left bank of the river Genil. It was once a Roman colony, and tradition has it that it was visited by St. Paul during his journeys in Spain. The Muslims called the town Istija and the river Chenil, even Sanjal. It was a fortified town of strategical importance, being a communication center which controlled movement in several directions. It lay on the main highway between Seville and Cordoba, about 30 miles from the latter. At the time of the Muslim approach, it contained a warlike and unsubdued citizenry, strengthened by reinforcements from Cordoba and many fugitives from the Barbate. It was commanded by a Gothic officer known for his vigor, resolution and cunning. The Muslims got to a spring four miles from Akija, known as Baranca del Milinilo, Gali of the Handmill. Tariq set up his camp here, after which it became known as Ayn Tariq, Spring of Tariq. From here, scouts were sent in the direction of Akija. These scouts returned to report a large concentration of Gothic warriors in front of the town, an army large enough to promise another hard and bloody battle. It was now about mid-August, the latter part of Shawal. Arraying his troops for battle, Tariq advanced against the Goths. We do not know what course the battle took, but it was a fierce contest in which the Muslims suffered heavy losses in killed and wounded. Chroniclers relate that although it was not of the scale of Barbate, this was the second hardest battle fought in Spain, and that the encounters which followed were not comparable in ferocity and bloodshed. At last the battle turned in favor of the Muslims. They scored a victory, but it was no more than a limited tactical victory. The Goths retreated in good order to the town. The Muslims moved up and laid siege to Akija, while on its eastern side floored the Genil. The western arc of town was protected by a high wall. The Muslims had no engines to breach the fortifications, and the siege went on for some days. It could have gone on indefinitely but for the curious episode of the Gothic commander coming out for a bath in the river. The Gothic general came out of the town to the river which flowed beneath its eastern wall. He came alone and began to bathe. He was seen by the Muslims. The situation gave an irresistible push to Tariq's adventurous spirit, and he too, without knowing the identity of the Goth, went to the same place for a bath. The fact that Tariq was alone and unarmed suggests that the place was right under the wall of the fort and regarded by the defenders as safe from intrusion by an enemy intent on battle. It may have been a well-used bathing point. Tariq also went in to bathe in the river beside the Goth, and here we have the incredible spectacle of two opposing commanding generals having a bath together without either of them knowing who the other was. Had the Gothic general suspected that the tall, sinewy Berber splashing in the water next to him was the Muslim army commander, he would have finished his ablutions hurriedly. Then Tariq pounced upon the Goth. The latter was evidently no match for the Muslim, for Tariq picked him up and hoisting him over his shoulder, made a dash for the Muslim lines, where he arrived safely without interference from the Christian soldiers on the wall. Perhaps he used the Goth as a shield. Once in the Muslim camp, the Goth revealed his identity as the commanding general of Akija. Thereupon, the Muslims proposed to their distinguished captive an honorable surrender. The Muslims would take the town peacefully, under treaty rather than by violence, in return for payment of the jizya. The Gothic general accepted the proposal. From the readiness with which the Muslims and the Goths agreed to terms, 
we can assume that both sides had been badly hurt in battle and glad to arrive at a solution, which averted further bloodshed. Tariq let the Gothic general go. He kept his word. Akija opened its gates and the garrison surrendered to the Muslims. There was no bloodshed, no pillage, no impost of any kind. The citizens paid the jizya and were left in peace in possession of their homes and property, free to practice their religion and live their lives as before. But not all wanted to live their lives as before. These were the Jews. They wanted a change, any change, for nothing could be worse than the brutal oppression which they suffered as a hated religious minority. Now for the first time they came out in open support of the Muslims, threw in their lot with the invaders and offered their services. The Muslims did not need their help because they would take Spain anyway, especially now that the back of Gothic resistance had been broken at the Barbate and Akija, but out of kindness they took the Jews under their wing, accepting them as followers of Prophet Moses salam, on whom be peace. A later chapter will describe the reasons for their defection. Tariq was also joined by a large number of malcontents, a motley crowd of Hispano Roman inhabitants who were glad to welcome the invaders. They saw the change as a release from bondage and an escape from the harsh servitude which they suffered under Gothic rule. This was of no direct military value to the Muslims, but with the change of heart among the oppressed elements of the people, which meant most of the population, word spread in the peninsula of the kindness and fairness of the conquerors. Everyone in Spain came to know that when Akija surrendered to the Muslims, there was no bloodshed, no bondage, no destruction. That all were safe and free, that all they had to pay was two dinars per head as jizya. This image fully deserved helped the progress of Muslim arms in Spain. The fears of the Goths and the ruling echelons correspondingly increased. Now little doubt remained about the Muslim invaders. They were obviously not a bunch of brigands who would burn and pillage and then return to where they came from. They had come to conquer and stay. Now even more Goths fled from the plains to keep out of the way of the Muslim cavalry. Even more of them took refuge in castles away from the main roads to avoid clashing with the Muslims as they advanced deeper into Spain. That Tariq received the rude letter of Musa bin Nusair. Akija had just opened its gates and plans were being made for the next operation. And now came this order from the commander-in-chief forbidding any further advance and ordering Tariq to remain in his present location until the commander-in-chief had joined him. The letter did not say when Musa would come, but it was obvious that it would be many months before he arrived at the scene. A student of war will wonder at the military wisdom of Musa's decision to hold Tariq back. At this stage, with the enemy trounced in battle and incapable of serious resistance, and with Spain lying almost defenseless at his feet, for Tariq to press on would be the height of military wisdom. Under certain circumstances, a small force can achieve results out of all proportion to its strength, results which would not be possible for a larger force when the situation has altered. Opportunity was knocking now. It would not wait forever. Certainly not for the coming of the commander-in-chief. Musa's instructions would achieve nothing more than to give time for the Goths to recover from their defeat reform and regroup their forces and dispute the Muslim advance with better prospects of success. Then all the Muslim blood shed at the Barbate and at Akija would be wasted. It is only in the light of what Muslim historians have described as his envy and anger is it possible to understand this direction to Tariq from a man of such towering strategical judgment as Musa bin Nusair. Luckily for the fate of Islam in Spain, Tariq did not obey Musa's orders. He knew exactly what was in Musa's mind, but like a good soldier and loyal subordinate, did not reveal his thoughts. He called a council of war. When his generals had assembled, he read out Musa's letter and asked for opinions. All present were aghast. 
They knew the importance of not allowing respite to a defeated enemy, of not letting an enemy on the run stop and recover his breath. The precious moment might not return. The generals made no secret of their disapproval of the untimely restraint being imposed by Musa upon the victorious forces of Islam in Spain. Then Julian spoke up. As a wise old chief, he was heard with respect. You have shattered the forces of the enemy and they are now panic-stricken, said the Count to Tariq. Make for their capital, and my skilled guides will lead you to it. Divide your army into several groups to take several directions in the land. Go yourself to Toledo, where their leaders are assembling. Prevent the enemy from deliberating upon their affairs and agreeing upon a chief to lead them. The wisdom of his words was unquestionable. Tariq and his generals would have pressed on without Julian's counsel, but the presence and advice of the wise and respected Count of Ceuta strengthened their hands and made it easier for them to disregard the instructions of their commander-in-chief. The main difference which Julian's advice made to Tariq's plans was that instead of going to Cordoba, as earlier intended, he now picked on Toledo as his main objective. He would bypass Cordoba already, leaving it to his colorful Arab subordinate, Maurice the Roman. End of chapter 7